so awesome in leading us in worship and you know sometimes it just kind of spills all out you know it just spills all over us and we praise the Lord for that glory to God man where would we be without Jesus where would we be without the Lord it'd be a sad life wouldn't it no don't want to go back don't want to go back and thank the Lord we don't have to man Jesus did good did good on us. I tell you, if you've, uh, I ask you if you did your homework, and uh, I don't know how many uh, actually found all the questions. They're they're not difficult to find, honestly. If you read if you read the book, it's only four chapters. Book of Malachi, last book of the Old Testament, uh, book at the end of an age, the end of the age of the Old Testament, the prophecy. As a matter of fact, this is the book that prophesies about John the Baptist coming. And about the hearts of the fathers being turned to their children and the hearts of the children being turned to their father, lest God would curse the earth, you know. So it's a tremendous book. The only thing that's known about Malachi, basically, is that his name means my messenger. That's pretty much about everything that's known about Malachi the prophet. But the tremendous writing that uh, the Lord gave his heart and, 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 and he penned as the Spirit of God led him, the Bible tells us that the great men of old were led by the Spirit of God, and they, as the Spirit spoke, they penned the things that were on the heart of God, especially these prophets who carry a message for, for God, for the age and for the time, and Malachi's message is surely distinct. It's very straightforward. It was written for a group of people that were waiting on the first coming of Christ. The people that were listening to the message of Malachi were Israelite priests, uh, temple workers, people uh, of Israel, tribes of Israel, the people of the common life of Israel. And Malachi's message was encouraging them to cleanse themselves. Yeah, straighten up like Brian. Yeah, straighten up and fly right, brother. As you wait on the first coming of Christ, which, by the way, would be about 400 years, pretty much. I mean, there's, there's 400 years between the book of Malachi and the book of Matthew of history, 400 years of history, where it's just basically silent, where the earth has heard the last message and is waiting on the promise of that message, the Lord Jesus Christ. John the Baptist is born about six months ahead of Jesus and actually begins to make straight the paths of the Lord a voice crying in the wilderness saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And the people, what would they do? They repented and they prepared their heart. And then Jesus came with a message of grace and salvation and the New Testament begins. So as the last book of the Old Testament sounds out, we get to hear the issues of life surrounding people on this earth. And I submit to you that in the message of Malachi, even though these people were waiting for the first return or the first coming of Christ, uh, and we are here now, 2,000 years later, waiting for the return of Jesus Christ, it's the same message. It's amazing. It's the, it's the same message. Oh, a few of the names and places may have changed, you know, but it's still the same word, and we're still in the same issues that were gripping Israel before the first coming of Christ. So this is not just a historical word that we can see what God had to say to these people a long time ago. This is a current word. Yesterday. This is yeah, yesterday and today and forever, right, Bill? Yeah. This is a current word. This is as if God were speaking directly to us just the same as he was speaking to the people who were waiting for the first return of Christ. Because ultimately in life, we as children of God should live our lives as if Christ was crucified yesterday, risen today, and coming tomorrow. You know what I mean? Our life is waiting on the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, there's needs to, and there need to be elements of our life that we pay attention to as we wait on the return of our Lord. And so in the book of Malachi, I just uh, title seven silly questions. And they're silly because they're insulting. Uh, God makes a charge. This is a, a pretty, by the way, uh, in Jewish life, uh, the way this book is written became and still is uh, 
one of the favorite ways of presenting material. And it's, uh, it's where God makes a charge and then they come back with an answer that's flippant, uh, insulting, uh, dishonoring, disrespecting, you know, a little flippant answer. And then God follows up with the calls for, for, his, for his charge against them. And uh, let's see if the Lord would say anything to us today. All right, all right, let's see if we can get going. All right, the first charge that was made, this, it, it, it uh, doubted God's love. It's really, in the first, it's really in the first couple of verses of the book. Uh, I have loved you, says the Lord, yet you say, in what way have you loved us? In other words, God said to the people, I love you. I've shown my love. I've proven my love. And they looked back at God and said, well, uh, we, don't know, we don't see how you love us. And so in waiting for the return of Christ, one of the things that we must do is protect our understanding and our vision of the way God loves us. Because it's really easy to miss the love of God in our life. Matter of fact, most people or many people, when they have trouble with whether God loves them or not, you might be sitting here this morning and thinking in your life, you know, I don't know whether God loves me or not. If God loved me like I think he ought to love me, my life would be much better than this. I wouldn't be sick and I wouldn't have these problems and my children would make straight A's in school and my family would be put together and I wouldn't have gone through all of these issues in life. I mean, my life would be much different if God really loved me like I think he ought to love me. And because it's always in times of trouble, trouble and turmoil, a child gets sick, you get laid off at work, uh, you don't get the person in your life that you've been praying for. And, and, and you ask, you know, if God is a God of love, why is this happening to me? Same question. <laughs> How have you loved this God? I heard of a stagecoach driver. You, you'll uh, just humor me a second with this little, I, I, it just popped in my mind. I heard it a long time ago, so, an old stagecoach driver that had picked up a woman passenger and her infant child. Freezing cold weather, just freezing cold. They got in the stagecoach, and the mother was trembling, the child was trembling, they didn't have enough to put on to, 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 to cover the cold, and, and the mother began to take off uh, her scarf and wrap the babe, and, and then take off her jacket or coat and wrap the babe, and, and, and she was sitting there just shivering, turning blue, and the child was crying, and the stagecoach driver stopped the coach, got out of the coach, opened the door, took, took the baby out of the woman's arms, pulled the woman out of the stagecoach, shut the door, got back on the stagecoach, and took off with the little baby in his arm. And here comes mom. Of course, what would mom do? Mom begins to chase the stagecoach. And she's running down the road, yelling and screaming after the stagecoach for a couple of hundred yards, and then he stops. And he gets down off the stagecoach. He opens the door back up. She gets in. He puts the baby in her arms, and she's warm again. All the adrenaline, all the effort, all the energy. Uh, it was a terrible thing. I thought of that the first time I heard it, and I heard somebody say that. I'm thinking, that stage, what in the world would he do something like that? When you hear that part of the story, you're almost angry about it. What in the world would he do that for? But when you hear the end, you see that even though it seemed to be a horrible thing at the time, it had a loving purpose. Now, I just say that. And, and when I think of that, I reflect on the way God loves us and how God prepares us and, 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 and comforts us and works in our life. And, and we just have to come to some conclusions in life, guys. And, some, and one of the conclusions we have to come to is we don't understand everything, but God does. And anytime anything happens in our life that we don't understand or makes us question God's love for us or God's uh, uh, sight or God's thought or whatever God we, we would have for God, the, the thing we have to write over that is Romans 8, 28. Romans 8, 28, our favorite passage of Scripture, what does it say? For we know that in all things God works together for good of those who love God and, are those, and to those who are called according to his purpose. And so 
If we get begin to deny or doubt or, 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 or can't see the love of God in anything that God is doing, just, just we come to the conclusion, God, you understand something I don't understand. You see something different that I don't see. But Lord, I'm going to believe Romans 8, 28 and believe that it, you're going to work everything in this in some way so that I'll be blessed and my life will be better than life. And if you have any doubt that God loves you, just simply look at Calvary. John 3.16 says what? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have life everlasting. Calvary is God's eternal gift of love to us and proves without a doubt that God loves us more than we love ourselves. Because I'll guarantee you that you wouldn't die for somebody like you. Well, oh, you might. You might die for something, but you wouldn't let your child die for someone like you. And God did, and God loves us. Uh, th this is a passage that just seems so relevant to uh, God understanding and God hearing. This is 1 Corinthians 10. You've quoted it a bunch of times. I know you have. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but will with the temptation, will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. And that verse doesn't say that God's not going to let us go into a temptation that's going to be overwhelming. It, what it does say is God is not going to let us go into one of those without making a way of escape. And that in every overwhelming situation, overbearing situation, God, this, this verse says God is aware. He knows what you're going through. He knows how far you can, he can take it. He's aware and he cares. He's going to make a way of escape. He's not going to let you go through it alone. He wants you to be able to bear it. Uh, and, and, and he wants to do something about it. So waiting on the Lord's return again <laughs> in this day, uh, God's love is doubted. God says, uh, I love you. Where have you loved us? God loves us in so many ways. Second, the second question came when God's name was despised. Uh, in a few verses down, verse 6, God says this, A son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I, I'm the father, where is my honor? And if I'm a master, where is my reverence? Says the Lord of hosts to you priests who despise my name. Yet you say, in, in, in what way have we despised your name? In other words, God looks at them and God says, um, you are dishonoring my name. And they look back at God and say, God, how are we dishonoring your name? Well, were they cursing? Well, not like you do out on the streets out here. But they were cursing by asking God to... Um, to curse, to curse a people or curse a nation. or cur In other words, they were, they were using the name of God to curse their enemies, to, uh, to bring a charge against their enemies. They were, they were lightly using the name of God. Now, I, I know that that may not seem like such a big deal, but do you know that God is very serious about his name? As a matter of fact, God is so serious about his name that one of the Ten Commandments is about his name. He says, he, he, he says, I take my name very seriously, and I'm not going to hold anyone guiltless who misuses my name. And the reason why is because in Hebrews, to the Hebrews, in this environment in which God wrote these things, uh, the name is very important. And I said this last week. We talked about Jacob wrestling with the angel, and the angel said, what is your name? And he had to confess, my name is Jacob. Well, he he wasn't just asking for identification. He was asking for, uh, for, for, who, for a character, for who you are, a confession. And so God takes his name very seriously because when you speak the name of God, that name should be honored and reverenced. It shouldn't be used lightly or flippantly or with disregard or with dishonor. And, and as we use the name of God, I know many times we can fall into things like that. We can just 
we can make statements, we can make vows in the name of God, I'm going to do this, and we can make promises to God, and, 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 we, can, and we can use those promises, and we can say things about other people, we can pray things, we can sing things and worship songs. We can use the name of God without ever even really thinking about what it is we're actually saying to God or promising to God or making a vow to God. You know, oh, Jesus, I love thee, you know, and, and then we act any other way but loving toward God. I will be faithful unto death, and you know, we won't even come to church next Sunday. I mean, you know, it, 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 we just, we, we, we flippantly, we lightly, we, with disrespect and dishonor, just use the name of God in such lightweight things. We don't keep the vows that we promise God, and we don't hold his name in high regard. So they were waiting for the first coming of Christ, and Malachi says, you know, God is displeased with that. And they said, how have we dis honored his name. We're waiting for the second coming of Christ. Honor his name. Here's the third. The third question came when God's worship was defiled. And uh, this happens very next verse, as a matter of fact, in chapter one. He goes on to say, um, you offer defiled food on my altar. I, I like the old, the old King James word, the original language is polluted food. Yeah, you, you give me polluted food, but, but you say, uh, in what way have we defiled you? And the Lord says, by saying that the table of the Lord is, is contemptible. In other words, God says, uh, mm, you're, you are polluting my table by treating it with contempt. Now, just so you'll know and be aware of what this table thing is all about, the table is, uh, of course, obviously a reference to uh, uh, the place where the food is placed, and then the food is placed, and someone sits at the table, and then they eat the food, and, and, and that's how the, 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 the meal is supposed to work. Well, in, when, when we're talking about the Lord, and I, I know um, many have, may not have ever thought about this, but in the Old Testament, you know, the Old Testament is filled with sacrifices, where you take a sacrifice and you put it on an altar. Yeah. And then that, 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 uh, the, the, the altar then consumes it in fire and, and, and the sacrifice is made at the altar. Well, what this represents, that the reason that they brought it to an altar and the altar consumed it and it was accepted by God was, uh, uh, was a practice to reflect um, fellowship with God in eating of a meal. The altar was the table, the sacrifice was the food, and when the fire consumed the sacrifice, it was God consuming the sacrifice and taking in the meal so that the meal could be enjoyed and received by God. God says, uh, you are putting polluted food on my altar and you are, you are treating my altar with disrespect and, 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 and I know that you're doing a bunch of religious things, but these religious things are, 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 are not properly setting the table here. I mean, you can be as religious as you can possibly be and, and stink to high heaven. God said, you, I, well, I'll remind you that it was a religious thing that took Jesus off the cross. It was the feast of Passover, and no one could hang on a cross on the feast, feast, uh, uh, feast of Passover. And so it was religion that crucified Christ, and it was religion that removed Christ from the cross. And, and, and God is saying to those who were waiting on the first coming of Christ that, that, you need, that, that, that my table is precious, and you need to honor me by offering legitimate, real sacrifices. So what were they offering? How were they polluting the table of God? Well, look at the very next verse. And when you offer the blind as a sacrifice, is it not evil? And when you offer the lame and the sick, is it not evil? Offer it then to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you favorably, says the Lord of hosts? God says, you're giving me the calls. The problem I have is, that, that you are dishonoring and disrespecting me by offering me the leftovers. 
You are not giving me your best. You are offering me a sacrifice of something that costs you nothing. Well, I think I'll, you know, I think I'll get up and go fishing this Sunday morning. Well, it's going to rain. Well, all right, I'll be wanting to go to church. I guess I'll run down there to the church since it's going to rain. I mean, you know. Come on. Well, you know, <laughs> I better not say it. <laughs> he wants, yeah, he wants, uh, these people were wanting to uh, eat cake and give God the crumbs. That's what it pretty much boiled down to. And God says, you try that on your governor. I mean, try it on your boss. Take your boss out to eat tomorrow night, and you get a steak and, and give him a hamburger. That gonna, he's going to be happy with you. That's going to be a good thing. You're giving God second best. You, you serve God when it's convenient. Uh, if you have any money left over, I'll give what's left over to God. David said, in Samuel, by the way, in 2 Samuel and in 1 Chronicles, two different, on two different sep, totally separate occasions, King David was about to offer a sacrifice, and the priest that he was about to offer the sacrifice saw that he didn't have a, a, a sacrifice to offer and offered David, King David, a sacrifice. Said, hey, David, I see you don't have a sacrifice to offer. You're out here in a battle, and you don't have one. Uh, I've got one in the back. Uh, I'll just give it to you. And David both times said, no, 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 no. You're not going to give it to me because I'm not going to offer a sacrifice that somebody else gave to me. I'll buy it from you. What is the price? Well, I, well I'll just give it. No, 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 no. And that's when he said, I refuse to offer God a sacrifice of something that costs me nothing. And so God doesn't want our second best. God doesn't want our culls. God doesn't want the crumbs from the cake that we eat of life. God deserves the best. He gave his best. He deserves our best. And the sacrifice, as a matter of fact, look, look this is how serious it was. This is a couple of verses later. God said, I would that one among you would shut the doors of the temple that no more vain fire should kindle on my altar. Is that too hard to understand? If it is, let me tell you what it means. God looks at him and says, it would be better for you to nail the doors of this church shut than to keep up with that phony kind of worship you've given me. Now that's pretty serious, <laughs> I would say. All right, all right, here we go. Fourth question. The fourth silly question came when God's holiness was denied. This happens in the second chapter, verse 17. You have wearied the Lord with your words, but you say, how have we wearied him? By saying that everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord and he delights in them, or by asking, where is the God of justice? Uh, let, me, let me stop there. And just explain that just a second before I go to Romans. The, see, the, what the people were saying is, the people were saying that, that God is not, is not holy. Uh, that living for the Lord is not a, a prospering thing. In other words, if you live for the devil, it seems like you prosper. But if you live for the Lord, it seems like you don't prosper. In other words, they put two and two together and get three and say, it seems like God blesses wickedness in life. So they're, they're, they're questioning the holiness of God, the justice of God, the fair, fairness of God. I mean, they're, 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 they're looking at their neighbor and, and, and they're saying, uh, my neighbor's wife got a new car. My, I, my wife didn't get a new car. Uh, he got a raise on the job. I, I hadn't had a raise since I started there. Um, uh, their child doesn't get sick. My child stays sick. Um, I don't get, they get everything they want. They seem to fly easy and I have to work and struggle for everything I want. In other words, they're looking at people around them and it says, it seems like God has blessed those who don't serve him and has forgotten those who do serve him. Now I'm glad we don't have that problem today, Right? I'm glad that that's gone away and that nobody ever thinks like that anymore. That's just a horrible way to think about God, that somehow God blesses people who hate him 
and doesn't bless people who love him. Whew. No, that hadn't gone away, has it? There are still people that think that way many times. Let me, let me explain it this way to you. When it comes to the things of God, now, and, and remember this, God deals with his children on a cash basis. In other words, um, you do it now, you, you pay now. <laughs> yeah. In other words, God disciplines his children. If God says, don't do this, and we do it, then God disciplines us. Right then, cash basis. Get it now, pay now. God deals with the devil's children on a credit basis. Let me show you this passage. This is where Romans chapter 2 comes in. Look at verse 5. But in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, so he's talking to people that won't listen to God, won't change their life, won't change their ways, won't do anything righteous because they have an impenitent heart. Their heart never changes. Their heart stays far from God. And he says, but in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. God is looking at them and God is saying, all right, let me tell you what you're doing. Now, it may look like you're getting away with all of this. It may look like I'm not going to come in judgment against your life. It may look like you're a high, wide, and happy, and sassy, and you're getting away with it. But what you're doing is you are just storing up wrath against the day of wrath. In other words, one of these days there's going to be a payday. One of these days the bill's going to come due. And when the bill comes due, all of that credit that you've been charging up against the day, against the day of wrath is going to be paid to you in full. If you were out and, and, and you had, your children and the neighbor's children were out in the yard and some scuffle broke out or some terrible thing and you had to discipline somebody, somebody was going to get it, and you went and you called the children, whose children would you call? Would you call your child or would you call your neighbor's child? Well, if you call your neighbor's child, we'll probably be seeing you on people's court or something like that somewhere. <laughs> no, you'd, char you'd call your child because it would be your child that you, you would take care of. And God does the same thing. And so many times when it looks like that the wicked are prospering and the righteous are suffering, it is simply because God's dealing with us on cash basis and he's dealing with the devil's children on a, on a credit basis. Let's go on. Here's the fifth question. It happens when God's invitation was declined. Uh, God's, well, let me just read the verse to you. Verse 7, chapter 3. From the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from my statutes, and you have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? Let me back up. How shall we? In, in other words, God looks at them and says, uh, you've gone away from me. You return to me, and I will return to you. And they say, well, we hadn't done anything. Where, where have we gone? I mean, right, yeah, right. We, we're, we've been right here. We're good. I mean, and, and, and then they begin to maybe look around for somebody else. I, okay, God, you're not talking to us because, I mean, here we are right here, and you had returned to me, and we hadn't gone anywhere. And so he must be talking. Who is he talking to? He's talking to those old wicked sinners out there. And this is the same kind of attitude that, that, that people have when, when somehow the Word of God begins to be spoken and, 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 and the Spirit of God begins to move in their life, and, and they begin to look around for somebody else. I mean, it's like, it's like, man, boy, I tell you, that was a word today. I, I sure wish old Bubba would have been there. Man, Bubba needed to hear that word. I'm telling you, as if 
the word's not for you, <laughs> but the word for somebody else. It's like those that sit in front have a shovel, and as the word hits them, they just shovel it right on over behind them, and the people sitting behind them are sitting there with umbrellas on. You know, I mean, it, it, the word of God is not. Instead of getting right ourselves, we look around to see if any of those old sinners are there that really need this word from the Lord. Return to me. The fact is, we can all return to the Lord. We all stand in jeopardy of being far from the Lord. And, and, and we all stand in jeopardy of not returning and, and responding to him uh, because the fact is, none of us are as close as we think we are. I had somebody say to me, in the book of James, you know, in the book of James, those of you that have read that book, you remember one of the things. He says, return to me and I will return unto you, says the Lord. It's one of the things it says in the book of James. Well, I had someone say to me that what the, that I said, well, God wants us to get closer to him, is what I said. And they said, well, there's no way. I said, what do you mean? They said, well, you know, when, when Christ comes in our heart, in our life, Christ comes inside of us, into our heart, and, and, we can't, and he lives in us, and so we can't really get any closer to God than, than that. And I thought to myself, well, if we can't get any closer to God, I don't have any idea what that passage means. Because it says, return to me, and I will return. Draw near to me, and I will draw near to you, saith the Lord. <laughs> uh, because the fact is, we're never quite as close as we think we are. And has God ever reminded you of that? Have you ever thought that you stood somewhere in the presence of God, that you were mature in some area of your life, that you had some things in your life under control. Uh, I'll never do that again. Uh, gosh, man, I don't know how I could have been so blind. What was I thinking about? I'll never do that again. And, and, and next week, you'll find yourself involved in something like that, and it'll be, a, it'll be one of those uh, revelation moments where you go, oh, my goodness, man. And, and, and it's just God reminding you that you're not quite as close as you think you are, and you can always come closer to God. So God says, all right, those of you that are waiting on the return of Christ, don't make the mistake of, of, uh, of, of dishonoring God by, re by, by refusing his invitation. Here's the sixth one. This is one that most people remember the book of Malachi for. It, it, it talks about God's treasury, and it talks about robbing God. Let, let's just see what it says. Will a man rob God? Yet you're robbing me, but you say... How have we robbed you? He says, in, in your tithes and offerings. And you're cursed with a curse, for you're robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. A challenge from God. He looks at them and he says, uh, you guys are, are robbing from me. And they say, what do you mean? What, how, how, how are we robbing from you? Now, I know that anybody that hears me speak or anyone else speak on tithing, many times there's a resistance to that. As if somehow... Uh, me or another pastor or religion or church or whatever you want to name it is trying to play some kind of horrible game on people to tell them that God wants them to give cheerfully, joyfully, and he has standards by which he is expecting us to give and, and holds us responsible for this. And it's almost like in some minds, it's, that's, that's sinful, that's evil, it's why would we do that? It's ridiculous. And it's the old uh, law versus grace argument. You know, the Old Testament tithing is taught. And no doubt about that. No doubt in the, in the law of God, in the book of Numbers, it, almost any book that has any standards or statutes from God is going to say something about the tithe or the giving of the nation of Israel. And I wrote in your notes, uh, I put a pretty good little extensive discussion about this just to show you what, we, what, it, what it says about this in the Bible. And you can see, honestly, that 
in the Old Testament, the Jews were required to tithe. What, does a tithe, what is a tithe? Well, the word means 10%. If you say, um, I'm going to tithe, it means you, you, you're saying, I'm going to give 10%. I mean, that's all it means. The word itself means 10%. And the Jews were, would, would be required to give 10% every year. Now, just to show you what this means now, and, I, and I'll show you why God did this. Every year, the Jews planted crops, or the, Drew, or, or the Jews had herds of animals. Some of them had animals and flocks and crops. Well, at harvest time, or at the time of birth of, of these animals and all of this, they were required to go out to their crops and to look at all of the return and to themselves take personally, go out there and carve out 10% of that harvest. Get the best of it that you can find. Get the best ears of corn, not the ones that are half eaten up with worm. Get the best wheat. Get the best barley. Get the best of everything and take 10% of the best and bring it down to the temple and give it to the Levites because the Levites were the preachers. All of the rest of Israel, all of the tribes of Israel were given land by God to divide among the tribe and to grow tro- crops and to have flocks and to, ha- and to make a living and have a life. The Levites had no land. The Levites were the keepers of the temple. The Levites were the preachers, the ones that, that kept the temple open and kept the place clean and kept things up kept and I mean they had no land and they didn't work uh, in the fields and and so God had to take care of them God had to provide for them and it were it was the ties of the people that provided for the levites and the poor and the needy and the orphans and the widows and so the, they were required to go down every year and pick out the best go to their flocks see all of the animals that were born look at them find the very best ones, take out the best ones, 10%, 10% of the best, take them down to the temple, and give them to the Levites. Now, what this did is this required an Israelite person to look at the blessings of God that God had blessed them that year. In other words, they didn't tithe like we so lightly do. They didn't just get out their checkbook and write a few numbers down on a check and come in and put it in a box up here and walk out there and sit down without any thought of what we just put in that box up here. They had to actually go out and see the blessings of God so that they would observe every year how much God had given to them. So they could know how thankful they needed to be to God who gave them all of that 90% of all of that that was left and only required that they give 10% to him. And then we come to the New Testament. Now in the New Testament, the argument is by many about tithing is we're Christians. We don't tithe. There's no requirement for a Christian to tithe. The Jews tithed under the law. But we're not under the law, we're under grace. So the argument becomes, okay, they tithed under the law, but now that we're under grace, we don't have to tithe. That's no longer a requirement for us. Well, in the book of Romans, I mean, just as a point, Romans 3.31, Romans 3.31 says basically, do we then make void the law through faith? <laughs> God forbid we establish it. In other words, Apostle Paul says, just because you got grace doesn't mean the law's out the door. Actually, grace is, is an establishment of the law. But, but, but the point being, I, I don't want to argue about all that, but the point being that in the New Testament, the standard of giving is everything. It's not a tithe anymore. It's you give everything. And God owns everything. The Jews were required to give 10%. I want to just remind you of that. That wasn't something that they did with a, with a free will. 
It wasn't like they passed the plate and said, all right, we want everybody here, if you can, to put in 10%. Uh Uh-uh. It was a bill you owed God. It was a bill you paid to God or suffer the consequences of it, you know. And so it wasn't a free will offering. They gave free will offerings for the widows and the orphans and, and projects and things like that. But the tithe wasn't a free will offering. Now we come to the New Testament and we're asked to give to God. I wrote in your notes about seven very notable times where Jesus talked about the tithe. In illustrations, he talks about it and he speaks of it favorably. And he says, and then he makes a point about giving and about abundant giving and about about being a cheerful giver and about being an overabundant giver and not being chinchy and tightwad and try to get by with as little as you can. And, and, and so my conclusion is what God expects from us is God expects from us to give out of the abundance that he has given us in life. I give far more than 10%. Many of you, I know, give far more than 10% in your life. And others are asking God, you know, what should we give and how should we give? And I don't think that anybody can buy their way to heaven, and I don't think that a tithe is some kind of magic payment to God. I would think simply that a tithe would be a beginning point, you know, and that I might want to give much more than that because God has blessed me in in much more abundant way because in the New Testament, the standard is Christ gave everything for us. We give everything for him. God loves a cheerful giver. And so be a cheerful giver. And God will speak to you, you know, about what you should give because I know people ask that all the time and they want to be right. I think the really only wrong way to give to God is to find out exactly how little you can give and give that. That, that I think, would be about the only wrong way to give to God. I know God's blessed many of you in many ways, and I know many of you feel that you could give far more than that, and that's a wonderful thing, and that's a blessing. And because of that, we have a church, and we have you know, a, a, a nice place to sit. We have some air conditioning. I see some of you fanning, but we do have some. It might not be on <laughs> right now. I'm sweating, and you fanning. But we do have some air conditioning because you guys give, and we have a stand to put the stuff on and lights and all of those kind of things. But these people were robbing God. These people were, these people were, were not giving God what, what God required in life, and they were robbing God. And, and God asked the question, will a man rob God? And yet you've robbed me. So as we wait for the return of the Lord, uh, pay attention to your giving. And, and, and I know I probably didn't answer anybody's question about tithing, but I, I can't be super strict and legalistic on it. Uh, but I do believe that God would honor you if you'll give everything you can and start with the tithe. My suggestion, start with the tithe. Go from there. All right, number seven. Here's the last question. Uh, it's when God's blessing is disregarded. Uh, how have we spoken against you? Uh, verse 13 of Malachi 3, your words have been hard against me, says the Lord. But you say, how have we spoken against you? you? You have said it is vain to serve God. What is the profit of our keeping his charge or of, or of walking as in mourning before the Lord of hosts? And, 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 and I, let me get verse 15. And now we call the arrogant blessed. Evildoers not only prosper, but they put God to the test and, and they escape. You know, before what they were saying is they were saying that it pays to serve the devil. Now they're saying that it doesn't pay to serve God. Uh, just to, just a flip on, on the thought, but, but they, were, they, they, were, they were denying the goodness of God. They couldn't see the goodness of God. You know, it, it, it's so amazing how easy it is to be blocked from seeing the goodness of God and how good God is to us. Let me read verse 16. This is the next verse, just, I think the Bible says it to you. Then those who feared the Lord. Now, I mean, this is what God sees when, when he says, you have uh, you've spoken evil against my name because uh, before you said that it pays to serve the devil, and now you're saying it doesn't pay to serve God. And, and let me just remind you of this, and this is what he says to them. Then those who feared the Lord spoke with one another. So the people began to talk to each other. And the Lord paid attention and heard them. 
And a book of remembrance was written before him of those who feared the Lord and esteemed his name. So in other words, God began to notice when God said this to them, and you despise my name. And then, and then the people started talking about it and said, you know, is it beneficial to serve God? I mean, is God really good to us when we serve him, when we please him? Does he, does he, does he give us things? Is it, is it worth serving God? And God began to create what he says is a book of remembrance. And, and, and he said, and, and he paid attention to those who, were, who had changed their heart and their mind about how good it was to serve God. But, but I want you to see verse 17. And this is what God said. Then shall be mine, they shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels and I will spare them as a, as a man spares his own son, then once more you shall see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve him. God says, listen, God says, all right, there's going to be a day, and I know you don't see it now, and I know you can't see it, and, and it's not in your mind, and, but I want you to know, God says, I want you to know this. One of these days... I'm going to make up my crown. I'm going to make up my jewels. That's what he says. In other words, he's going to take the people who serve him, the people that love him, the people whose lives are bent toward him, and he's going like precious jewels to make up his crown. And, 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 when, he, and when he sees you, he's going to say, there's my diamond. There's my ruby. There's my, there's my emerald. There's my, my topaz. You know, in other words, he says, if you serve me, you're going to make a, I'm, I'm going to, you're going to be in a crown one day. You're going to be part of my, my jewels in heaven, which is really just a promise that God says, look, there's a payday someday, and I know you don't see it now, but it pays to serve me. You know, I asked the question in a message not long ago, will a man serve God for nothing? And I talked about all the different kind of motives we could have for praying and and, and singing and coming to church and worshiping and all that kind of stuff. And, and then at the conclusion, I, I asked the question again, will a man serve God for nothing? And then answered my own question by saying, uh, that's impossible to do. It's impossible to serve God for nothing because God always has a promise attached to his service. God always has a reward attached to obedience. And his service. And here he says, I'm making up my crowns one day. Now, to show you the distinction, he goes on in chapter 4, which is a very short chapter, but look at what he says. This is what happens to the wicked. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly will be stubble. And the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts. That, That will leave them neither root nor branch, But to those who fear my name, the son of righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings, and you shall go out and grow fat. I kind of already am. (laughs) I'm getting a little preview of that right now. And you shall go out and grow fat like stall-fed calves. You shall trample the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts. God's promised. God said there's a payday someday. And I'm making up my jewels for those of you who serve me and love me and know me. And the evil have their rewards coming. Better to be the part of the jewels of God than the ashes under the feet of the righteous, I would say. And these are seven silly questions that were asked by a generation that was, that was waiting on the, the coming of Christ. We are waiting on the return of Christ. Um, God says the same thing to us that he said to them. Don't despise my name. Don't doubt my love. Don't don't defile my worship. Don't deny my holiness. Don't decline my invitation. Don't deplete my treasury. Don't disregard my goodness. All of those things are blessings of the Lord.